Patrick, what a great day this is. I mean, um, been waiting for me to, to meet you in person. You wrote this amazing book, uh, Why Liberalism Failed, and I uh, read it with a tremendous attention, and, and, it, and it, it reinvigorated me because I was going through the doldrums, especially in Maine, the winter time, and I saw hope for the first time. I, I mean, haven't had that kind of feeling since I read Christopher Lash. Uh, it's been, I mean, those voices have disappeared, seems to have disappeared from the academic and intellectual landscape in the United States. And so uh, you come up with this thesis, which is very, which seems controversial to a lot of people, a lot of liberals. And, uh, and I find it to be incredibly um, promising if we take it seriously and, and work with it and build a better future. So I'm gonna ask you a few questions about, about the book, about your thesis, and then we'll take it from there. And in no particular order, one of the questions, one of the things you say in the book, that you say democracy cannot function in a liberal regime. And what, what do you mean by that? Well, you're going right to the, uh, the heart <laughs> of the matter here. <laughs> I mean, I, I think maybe we have to take a step back and just, just say a little bit uh, about what I mean by liberalism, because many of your viewers and listeners might automatically think that means I'm talking about sort of the Democratic Party, and I'm not talking, I'm, I am talking about the Democratic Party, but not only the Democratic Party. When I say liberal, I mean the political philosophy of liberalism that has a kind of, is inaugurated in the kind of social contract tradition of you know, late, 17, late 18th century Britain and uh, gets uh, imported to the United States. It's articulated by our founding fathers. And then it's further developed uh, in, uh, from its kind of classical liberal origins into its progressive liberal form. And what makes it in some ways continuous, even though today we think of classical liberalism, what we call conservative and progressive liberalism, progressivism as opposites, its core similarity is the ideal of being liberated from any kind of unchosen sense of self, any unchosen inheritance, any unchosen form of identity. It's, it's a kind of idealized form of autonomy that's pictured or imagined in the fictional imaginary state of nature. And you could say that our entire political, social, economic, cultural order is organized around the creation of this radically autonomous, liberated self. And the thesis of the book is that this, this theory, this imaginary ideal of the autonomous individual becomes more and more realized the more liberalism sort of becomes true to itself. Mm -hmm. And I think we're seeing the fruits of that all over in our world today. And when we think of many of the pathologies of the modern world, it actually has its origins in what I see as a kind of false understanding of, of, human, uh, of the human person. So you asked a question about democracy. And democracy, of course, it has a, an ancient lineage, uh, but it is, um, as, I, as I best I would understand and define it, there's democracy, which is the kind of the civic and political order of kind of mutual obligation in which we as the demos, as citizens, have a kind of obligation to speak, to listen, to debate, to take into account the views of others, at times to compromise, at times to be victorious. But this is the action and activity of citizenship. This goes all the way back to Aristotle. It's defined by Tocqueville in Democracy in America when he talks about the New England townships and what it is that he admires about the New England townships. Now, how do you reconcile that idea of democracy with what I just described as liberalism? So we today talk about liberal democracy as if they're the same thing. But in fact, they're actually rather opposite, at least as I, as I would define them and understand them. And what we often describe, or when you hear people use the word democracy, like our democracy is in danger, what they typically mean is that liberalism is in danger. And if you begin to just make that switch in your mind, you begin to see that this, this helps explain why democratic outcomes, electoral outcomes that liberals don't like are called anti-democratic. <laughs> Right. Yeah. right. So, so in other words, I think it's important to distinguish between these two phenomena of liberalism and democracy and to understand that if democracy doesn't conform to what liberalism seeks, then liberals will say that that's not genuine democracy, right? And they will actually be willing to jettison certain kinds of democratic outcomes that don't conform to liberalism. So I think one of the things that we're seeing in our world today is the rise of a kind of democratic rejection from the bottom up of aspects of liberalism. This gets defined as populism, 
and that's how you dismiss the outcomes, which are democratic. That, that's, that's very interesting because you say in your book that the lib liberalism has, has led to the creation of an all-powerful surveillance state and uh, with a great police powers and, and so on. And so it goes against the very spirit of the very spirit of liberalism as it is conventionally understood. It's a yeah, it is. It kind of, again, we see the, these kinds of paradoxes everywhere yes. today. Uh, but it is, um, the, it, it's a kind of natural consequence. And this is one of the things, again, that I argue that, that the more liberalism succeeds, the more it both becomes itself and contradicts itself. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways that that happens is that a, a, a political, social, cultural order always needs kind of boundaries. It always needs ways to, you know, declare this out, outside of this boundary, outside of this guardrail. You should not step. This is, this is forbidden and this is allowed. But one of the things that liberalism does in the pursuit of this autonomous individual is to dis disassemble kind of all of the guardrails that are not basically created by the state. So what we might think of as cultural boundaries, inherited traditional boundaries, religious boundaries, familial boundaries, literal boundaries of, you know, separating one people from another people, all of these start to come down in the liberal order because these all represent limitations on the autonomous individual. What takes its place? Well, you have to have more and more state. The, the state has to have a mo much more of a role in policing the infractions uh, that will inevitably occur. So the image here that I think we should have in our mind is, uh, uh, interestingly, a non-liberal thinker, but I think someone who reveals this kind of logic, which is Hobbes' Leviathan. And when you think of the frontispiece, the famous illustration of Hobbes' Leviathan, it's all these fragmented individuals whose only relationship is, in a sense, to the state and not to each other. And in a way, that's the kind of end station mm -hmm. of where liberalism tends. So you, you could almost say that Thomas Hobbes is sort of like the spiritual father of modern-day liberalism. I, I think he... Hobbes helps us to see yeah. how um, a philosophy that's based in the ideal of liberating individuals from each other in the name of autonomy results in one of the most sort of centralized, authoritarian forms of political governance. Is he helping us see that? Or is he, in some indirect way, creating that kind of imaginary society or that kind of social uh, system, the new social system to which now we have to adapt. So, because again, you mentioned the, some of this in your book. Yeah, no. So the thesis of the book is that um, it's actually it goes in a, in a certain way against human nature to be these kinds of autonomous individual, yeah. right? I mean, there's no human being that's born autonomous, right? We're born <laughs> dependent. We will probably become dependent uh, if we're not already. We're already dependent in lots of ways, but we'll certainly be much more visibly dependent as we age. Uh, and become much more reliant on other people. So this idea, idea of autonomy is really, as you know, the great political theorist Bertrand de Juvenel said, the social contract theorists were all childless, uh, mm -hmm. they were all childless men uh, who had forgotten their own childhood. Their own childhood, yes. Right. Uh, and I think that, but I think that that, great, that observation has a kind of kernel of truth to it, which is that it requires you to kind of um, obscure the fact of our dependency to posit this imaginary condition of autonomy. And because this is an imaginary condition in some ways, or it runs counter to the human experience and even arguably human nature at some level, it has to be created. It has to be sort of artificially created. And the way in which it's artificially created is through what we think about as the modern forms of you know, the modern market, the modern state modern technology and the applications of modern technology, right? We don't have to have suburbs, right? Suburbs are the kind of technology. We don't have to have suburbs, but we decided we're gonna live in a way mm -hmm. in which we don't have to have any real obligations and relationships with our neighbors. You can have it if you want, but we organize our society as opposed to an old kind of New England town in the way that that town is structured. And I grew up in a New England town with front porches and it just felt you were part, much more part of a community. So this, idea of the individual, which was posited as an, as an imaginary condition, is it becomes more and more the creation of the liberal state, the liberal economic order, the liberal social, cultural, educational, technological order. It creates this creature. But in order to maintain this imaginary form of autonomy, it has to sort of 
extend its fingers into more and more of human life. Even to the point in which, as we see today, the persistence of forms of inherited or unchosen bonds and relationships have to become increasingly disassembled. And maybe the one that's above all, the kind of the toughest nut to crack is the family. But I think what we're seeing today in today's world is a real concerted efforts to say, we're gonna sort of crack open the idea of the human family. We're gonna reconfigure it, we're gonna redefine it, and ultimately we'll have technological means no longer to have to have it. I, I mean, a lot of what you say, I keep, I mean, I, I keep, I, I keep thinking of Marx and all that is solid melt, melts into air. So one other thing, it's, it's, it's a, what I find a little bit intriguing and a little curious, is both you and in some extent, you know, Christopher Lash as well in this notion of progress. You know, it's almost like there's a deliberate attempt to avoid naming capitalism as the main culprit of this. It's as if, if, we're, if we were to mention the name capitalism or to use the, the word capitalism in our books, in our theses, in our critiques, uh, people would not take us seriously, would not take the, 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 the idea seriously. Is, that some, is it a sentiment I might have or is it something that you, you think oh, is I real? Think, I think it's certainly the case that Lash is a critic of capital, yes. capitalism. Yes. And I am too, I probably don't name capitalism um, by that word. I talk more about the market, but yes. when I talk about the market, I mean this kind of, again, this idealized version of the market, yeah. which sort of free market capitalists describe as the ideal. And that's, this is again, this is a market that's all encompassing, that's unbounded, right? It's globalized, it has no boundaries. In fact, it, right, it's exactly those sentiments by Marx, all that is solid melts into yes. air, right? It's the, it's the way in which all of the, the limitations on our sense of being market participants ultimately have to come down, ultimately have to be overcome. I think um, when I use this language of market, I also have in my mind the ancient idea of market, yes. which is of course yeah. the agora, it's, yeah. the, it's the Greek ideal of the market, yeah. which is a specific space, mm -hmm. and it's a space within the polity. It's not, it's, in other words, it's a space that's bounded by the political order, and has to, it has to in some ways be subsumed by and ordered by the understanding of the common good. When we use the language of market today, or when capitalists use the language mm -hmm. of market today, they mean something that's autonomous, mm -hmm. and in fact, in which political entities are confined within or found within the, the market, right? So it reverses what the classical understanding had been, where the market is, a, is bound and located within the polity. Today, when we talk about the market, it's one market, yeah. it's, it encompasses all politics. Yes. And so it escapes any concept of the common good. And it becomes, again, in the name of liberating us as these, as these sort of sovereign free choosers, uh, the market is ab absolutely one of the most powerful forms of this creation of this sense of individual autonomy. I, I would say, because you say in your book, you talk about, you know, the beginning with Machiavelli and all on, you know, Francis Bacon is a, plays a huge role in this, basically the scientific revolution and the scientific enterprise, if you will, together with the, uh, um, almost like it was, it, it resulted in an assault on the ancient notions of community and so on, and a new notion of, of society as with the discrete individuals pursuing their self-interest and the state making sure the, rule, the rules of the game are well respected and so on and so forth. So I'll, part of this, this scientific revolution, this new polity that emerged at the same time uh, led to a notion of ab abundance, infinite, uh, uh, development, if you will, and so which characterizes the rise of capitalism. So the, uh, I, would, I would not call capitalism a market system in the sense that it was a big philosophy, just like you even call liberalism a technology, which is fascinating. And so it was a new world order that was created when with this, all these systems came together, the new systems, uh, the new industries, new technologies to create a new world order that had not existed before. At the heart, but at the economic engine of this is the capitalist system because they are now justifying the endless pursuit of abundance or in some, uh, Christopher Lash talks about luxury for all and so on and so forth. So, and this is the end that's gonna get us. It's gonna destroy humanity and the planet. Yeah, so in fact, um, in the beginning, I think the first chapter of the yes. book, uh, the two 
the two ways in which I define liberalism, which yes. is obviously, you know, lots of people define liberalism in various ways. Yes. The first way in which I say liberalism is a, is a distinct order from anything that preceded it was, was exactly what I was just describing, yes. which is the liberation of the individual from other individuals, yes. right? The, the, the creation of the autonomous indiv individual. And then the second way I think it's very distinct is that the other, the other way in which we have to be free is to be free of nature, right? Yes. That, that's the other great limitation on our autonomy. Yeah. And this is where sort of you have Hobbes on the one hand and you have Bacon on the other. And Hobbes actually served as, ba as Bacon's secretary for yes. a time, so there's a really interesting connection there. Uh, but, but Bacon is really the originator along with Descartes, with Hobbes and others, uh, and uh, of understanding that the human, the human concept of, of nature and the human relationship to nature had to fundamentally change. And rather than in some ways understanding human beings as a part of nature and that part of what was science, which of course meant knowledge, it wasn't just narrowly te technocratic, but it was knowledge, part of what scientia was, uh, was the understanding of how human nature and the natural world were in some ways coextensive. Mm -hmm. uh, Bacon, it seems to me, is one of the revolutionary thinkers to argue that we only can become, in a sense, sovereigns when we have the ability to master nature, to see ourselves as separate from nature, to see ourselves as somehow standing apart from nature. So he has a kind of God's eye view of nature, right? That human beings have to assume a kind of God's eye view of nature. And we become in some ways a kind of co-creator with mm -hmm. God. We, through our knowledge, our ability, our technology, have the capacity to recreate and remake nature now in our own image or in the image of what serves us. It, we make nature our servant. There's a chilling uh, passage in Bacon that I think I mentioned in the book in which he compares nature to a prisoner who withholds its secrets from us and needs to be tortured in order to elicit, uh, in order to force its secrets into the open. Mm -hmm. This is, a, this is a, a, an image um, that becomes uh, often cited by Many liberals over a period of time, including John Dewey, who cites it favorably, calling Bacon the greatest philosophical thinker in the, in, 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 in the history of the West. So the progressive tradition, which Bacon has a, I'm sorry, Dewey has a profound influence in founding, at its core has as well this kind of Baconian element to it, which is that we only become truly free when we have the ability to master nature. So you see it in its capitalist form. You also see it today in the kind of, you know, the, the, the effort to shape, ch transform, and dominate human nature, human biology. And mm -hmm. these, these are both kind of sides of the, sort of two sides of the same liberal project. So, I mean, they're coterminous. In other words, liberalism, capitalism, scientific revolution, or scientific thought, so to speak, modern sci scientific thought. They, they all are part, they, I don't know, I mean, who, who, who comes first, who comes next? I mean, it, it's very hard to dis, the decipher the, or to split the differences, yes. Uh, yeah, I would just say that um, I'm a political theorist, yes. and so my approach tends to be idea-based, which is, I, I think it is the case that human societies are obviously complex, and you know, I think Marx has a point, which is that material circumstances drive a lot of social change. But I also think that human beings are creatures that think our way into new forms. We are imaginative creatures. And we use our imaginations. We use our vision of what human society can and should look like. And that has a powerful shaping force. And you know, if you're an American, you can't help but notice the way in which that philosophical system, that philosophical tradition, informed the very founding and the development of the American political, social, economic project, right? So it, it's just undeniable, it seems to me, that these ideas have a powerful shaping force. And to the extent that the United States, you know, America is a kind of, you know, extraordinarily powerful, influential nation, political order uh, in today's world, it kind of is in some ways the manifestation of the of the course of liberalism. Yes, and of the Constitution itself, you, you mentioned in the book, is, yeah. is yeah. the- Very controversial among many of my friends who are <laughs> very passionate, uh, ardent admirers of the Constitution. Yes. And I suggest that the Constitution had a kind of, um, a bad seed that it planted. In well, I mean, a to, country like the United States, a country of immigrants, people coming from all over the, all over the world, cannot but be a, a collection of individuals. When I was coming to the United States, a uh, neighbor of mine, an older lady, the mother of my friend, when I told her I was coming to the United States, she said, oh, 
it's, it, it's a country of ruthless people. Um, I mean, um, she's not educated. She just like lives in Morocco. She never probably left. And there's this idea that the United States is a land of immigration, a land that's very open and hospitable to immigrants, but at, at the same time, it's a collection of individuals coming from all around the planet. And so the only way to get them together is through a, you know, the, the, a set of democratic system of representative democracy and maybe the power of the law. Other than, other than that, there's no, there are no rituals, no common rituals that unite them in the ways that unite some other societies. Mm -hmm. So of course, um, you know, it's a, it's, this is a complicated story because yes. um, I think of the American experience as, at least for most immigrant, in most immigrant experience, as a nation of groups, mm -hmm. as, a, as a kind of collection of cultures. Yes. Uh, so I'm Irish, Irish Catholic, yeah. uh, and I live in South Bend, Indiana, and you have um, churches in all of these neighborhoods that were originally the churches where only the Italian Catholics would go, or only the Polish Catholics would go, or the Irish Catholics, St. Patrick's, and you have St. Hedwig for the Poles, and you have St. Anthony for the Italians. So it was a very, you know, it was a kind of culturally very pluralist society, even within these traditions of Catholicism, within the traditions of Judaism and so forth, very pluralistic, but it was not at its core individualistic, at least for the immigrants who came here. It became more individualistic over time, and I do think that is part of the power of this liberal order, is over time, over the course of generations, it takes these sense of ourselves as part of a group, and part of a tradition, and having an inheritance, and it begins to kind of work its sort of solvents, uh, solvent uh, on, on that under self-understanding. And within, usually typically within several generations, people really no longer identify with those particular traditions. And you know, I think it's a good case in point in my own background where I think almost no one I grew up with would identify as Catholic anymore. You know, they just much less as a you know, member of an immigrant group or yeah. a kind of subculture. I mean, it really is, has this very powerful shaping force. You could say that this is a kind of necessary thing because we are such a pluralistic society. At the same time, you could say this also, of course, leads to many of the pathologies we're now experiencing, which is radical sense of loneliness, of isolation, of individualism, of kind of not having those kinds of groups and traditions to rely upon, of not being able to pass something on to your children, of feeling kind of culturally isolated. So, you know, as with anything, there are costs, there are benefits, um, but I think we are seeing a kind of, you know, as, as one typically does, the benefits of a political order are also generating their costs, and those are becoming more and more visible, and the bill is coming due. So, if I could translate what you just said, yeah. so in the beginning, there was a, a uh, uh, the United States was a nation of tribes, uh, not immigrant groups, but and each immigrant group had its own cultural traditions, yeah. Italian, Polish, you know. And, Even before uh, that, of course, yeah. all of the states yes. had their distinct religious uh, establishments. Yes. Right? So Massachusetts uh, was Congregationalist, and yes. Virginia was Anglican. So there, you know, even within the same tribe of Protestants, yes. you had you know, very distinct kind of tribes. Absolutely, yeah. And then, you know, with, with the, as, as these immigrant groups became more successful, more assimil better assimilated in American society and so on, those traditions that they brought with them began to vanish and disappear, and there, was, there are no national traditions to replace them. Yeah, so the national traditions become increasingly abstract, um, so it's either theoretical, philosophical, and in my world, in the political theory world, it becomes an allegiance to the principles of the Declaration of Independence so that we're all created equal and that we're endowed with certain rights. So we really understand ourselves as fundamentally as rights-bearing creatures. But those rights become detached from a sense of duty and obligation and a kind of sense of gratitude. So everyone is very quick to assert their rights as individuals. Right? But now when you lose that kind of thicker sense of membership, the corresponding sense of duty and obligation falls away. You know, it's, it's, it's striking to me that um, it wasn't that long ago that it was kind of an expected thing that if you were a member of the ruling class, you would st spend some time serving in the military. Mm -hmm. right? So when I taught at Princeton, there were all these stars on the windows of dorm rooms mm -hmm. where there had been a student who had fallen during one of America's wars. And it was a kind of just expected that if you were going to be a member of the American ruling class, you would spend some time in kind of some form of public service or public duty. It's almost, it would be a, you know, extreme rarity to come across a student at one of the top elite universities today who has any intention or plan of serving in the military, of, of kind of taking some time out of their well-planned career path. 
uh, to, so I, that's just an example we could say of the way in which the understanding of ourselves primarily as the bearers of rights and as, the, as defined by our individual rights really does shape, it, it, it's not a neutral, it's not a neutral or kind of um, contentless set of beliefs. It actually has a deep content. And I think this is one of the things that uh, people picked up from my book. Liber the claim of liberalism is that it has no preconceived notion of how we should live, and that's its value. Its value is we can, all these people who are different can live together in peace. Yes. I'm not gonna tell you how to live, you're not gonna tell me how to live, right? This is the main way of life up here, right? Everyone's, everyone does their own thing up here, nobody bothers anyone else. But, and we tend to think that that's neutral, that that doesn't have, there's no finger on the scale when you, when you have that point of view. In fact, that is a point of view, that is a content. And that content really is, makes us and shapes us into these idea of ourselves as individual rights-bearing creatures who are autonomous and free. And so those parts of ourselves that might be more bound, um, more um, as members of something larger than ourselves, as creatures that are um, you know, embedded in all kinds of webs of relationships and obligations, that tends to fall by the wayside. You know, one of the things you say in your book, too, is that uh, liberal culture is profoundly anti-cultural. And, um, but, and I, uh, so this reminded me of a conversation or a, uh, uh, or a thesis or a discussion that Terry Eagleton uh, published in 2000 called The Idea of Culture. And he, com and he differentiated the German notion of Kultur from the French idea of civilization, either which is ominous and cosmopolitan and all of that. So the, there was a, it was a sense in the 19th century that the idea of culture in the German sense was anti-capitalist, um, uh, was not in any way uh, corrupt by this new notion of cosmopolitanism and so on and so forth. So it, it kept together the, the, uh, the, the, the Volk, I think, and other people together and so on. So is that idea of culture, could it be like a, some, is it like a, a, um, uh, uh, a too much of an idealistic concept that, that to be real or how do you, what, what's your so, sense of that? Yeah, well, I think in some ways you could say that that understanding of culture, especially as a kind of form of high culture, yes. is almost in some ways it, it occurs simultaneous to the beginnings of the decline of culture in the way that I mean it and I describe it in which culture, I would, as I would describe it when I, when I yeah. argue that liberalism is an anti-culture, culture in many ways, of course, has its high, high cultural dimension, but it also is something that sort of percolates up from the bottom. Yes. It's a kind of, you know, broadly speaking, it's what we might describe as traditions of customs, customary ways of life, how we come to know to do things things that are acceptable, things that are not acceptable, and you're not, you're not necessarily taught these, sometimes you're taught these, but most of them you kind of gain it by osmosis as a part of growing up in a civilization. It's often connected to religion, in fact, it's almost always been connected to religion, but not only religion, it's you know, family and communal norms and customs, um, and often relatively unexamined. It's just part of the, part of the atmosphere that one grows up in. It's the fish, it's the water that the fish swims in, you could say, the human water uh, is culture. And part of what I've been describing is that this form of culture is, a, is of course a form of constraint upon our individual autonomous, freely choosing self, right? It's maybe the most, along with nature, it's the most limiting aspect. This has to be disassembled. And what in a way comes to replace it and how we use the language of culture is this kind of detached elite culture that's the process of the creation of genius minds, not the kind of something that percolates up. Yes. Now, in its, I would say in its kind of best form, it's kind of both. It's, it's, it's Shakespeare, it's the Globe Theater, which, you know, you have your nice boxes with, with the cushioned seats if you can afford it, if you're a member of the nobility, but you also have the people who pay a penny and they stand up, you know, in the, um, you know, on the, uh, in the ground um, uh, to watch the plays. And the plays are often a kind of combination of drawing on high and low culture. And that to me is kind of, that's a culture which has that rich, both common dimension, the common sense dimension, as well as an educative high form. Uh, and that, that I think is, it informed um, when John Adams spoke of what a constitution should have. He spoke that there needs to be a strong commitment to the idea of liberal education, especially for the common folk. 
that it's not something that's merely for the elites, that a liberal education, that is to say, what it is to be free, to, be, to learn how to be free, which is different than being a liberal in the way I describe it, uh, to learn the art of self-governance means that this sense of culture, being a part of an inheritance, has to be, in a sense, universal, widespread, uh, and not simply a kind of detached elite um, culture that, uh, that's only accessible by a relatively small number of people. Would you say China or Japan, or, or maybe separately, one or the other, have re right today have a liberal culture? Hmm. I don't know enough about either of those civilizations to speak to it. Um, I suspect that as, you know, in as much as I know, for example, China, uh, because it comes from a much more Confucian tradition, I would suspect that it does not have the same liberal understanding of the human person. Yeah. Right? We might say they have their own pathologies that result from not, not a strong enough sense of the individual. Right? But, um, uh, but I think uh, without being able to say much about um, specific aspects of either civilization, I would suspect that, that they're not similarly liberal. That's right, and, they, and, and the reason I'm asking those questions is because, they, because of their deep historical traditions and in, in, entrenched historical uh, cultural traditions. You know, if, if let's say they get tired of this new system that they live under now and they wanted to go back to an older uh, tradition, they have the language to do so. Uh, what, what's, to me personally, what I feel like in the United States, like you're trying to do in your book, Let's, let's, uh, let's move away from this liberal tradition and move back to where? Well, so we also, of course, have this language and yes. we have these understandings. Uh, and we have to understand that while we think of liberalism as the only legitimate form of self-governance and rule and uh, organization of modern society, it's relatively new on the scene. It hasn't been around that long. I mean, if we think of the, you know, we, I've talked about a philosophy that's about 500, 600 years old. But if we think about its actual political instantiation, it's only been around about 200 something years, if the United States is the marker, you know, maybe England a little bit. Um, but it's only, it, it's, it's kind of still in, a, in its experimental stage, yeah. I would say. You know, it, it hasn't lasted as long as a lot of other regimes, not, certainly nothing close to you know, Rome or something. So I would say that we're, we're still sort of, we're kind of, we're still getting the data. You know, we're still, you know, this, the problem of political science is the only way to really do the scientific project is to try it and see how it works. And communism, that didn't work that well. You know, fascism, we know, was horrific. And liberalism, it turns out, may not be that much uh, longer lasting than some of these other regimes. Uh, yes. yes. Uh, so uh, this is to say, um, we do have, of course, the West has a tradition. Um, and it is, broadly speaking, the Christian tradition. In Europe, parts of Europe, you have the Catholic tradition, which is, of course, much more communal. It's much more understanding of ourselves as bound together. Um, and you could say that part of what the liberal tradition has been is the effort to overthrow that part of the Western tradition, specifically the Aristotelian Thomistic side of it. Hobbes, Locke, Bacon, they all name Thomas Aquinas and the Aristotelians as like object enemy number one. What is the argument of those thinkers? Aristotle, not a, not a Christian, right? Aquinas, Catholic, Christian. The argument is that we are by nature political animals. So what he's saying is that for, in the case of the United States, we, ha we need to make an appeal to a larger civilizational model, you know, like, like something like the West. Yeah. So, I well, mean, if, I, if I may, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's not that long ago that you had, I mean, you still have in, in Europe, you have Christian democratic parties. Mm -hmm. And what are the Christian democratic parties? These are the parties that created the kind of social welfare net that anti-Christian progressives now think is the great legacy of progressivism. It's not the great legacy of progressivism. It's the great legacy of Christian democratic parties and Christian democratic thinkers. Yes. And why are those kind of much more robust forms of social safety net, why are they as robust as they are in Europe? It's because of that tradition mm -hmm. that we want to now obscure and we want to claim that was never part of our, our self-understanding. That's still there, right? Those elements are still there. Now it's being, it's being weakened in all kinds of ways because the genuine sense and the experienced sense of being part of something that's greater than ourselves, as being political animals, that's waning. It's waning throughout the West. But, um, but I would not suggest by any stretch that that's not part of our vocabulary as well. It's not Confucian, but it's a different part of our vocabulary.
But again, you keep, you, keep, you, keep looking, you keep looking beyond America's borders just to find examples in, in the European tradition. But I'm saying for those in the United States, for those who have the only the United States to work with, I mean, when you, want, when you appeal to a tradition or when you appeal to some form of life that existed at a time and place before the onslaught or before the triumph, the complete triumph of liberalism, I, I probably, I suspect, you know, people would, you'd think of the lower middle, lower middle classes or the uh, petty bourgeoisie and so on and so forth, because that's where the traditions and the, the, the spirit of America probably was b well kept or better kept. Yeah, yeah. And now we we're moving into lash territory. Yes, right? yes. Yeah. But, but yeah. where else could you go? Where else could you go? Yeah. So I think that's right. I think, so first of all, um, uh, you know, the, the, the book that, uh, that will be coming out in June called Regime Change mm -hmm. really is an effort to analyze the way that liberalism not only is a kind of philosophical undertaking, but it's an effort to replace one aristocracy with another aristocracy or another meritocracy, if you want to call it that, or another, basically replace one ruling class defined in one way in the aristocratic tradition of inheritance of status that, that you get from your parents with another form of uh, another elite, another ruling class, that's defined in particular by its ability to flourish without the kind of guardrails I've been talking about. In other words, there are people who are gonna do very well in a system in which you eliminate culture, in which you liberate the individual, in which you, de you know, sort of demolish the kind of associational life of the nation. And those people are doing very well because it turns out you're able to replace a lot of that through kind of financial, um, you can replace you know, community by joining soccer clubs and creating travel soccer teams and you, know, you, you, can, you can move into neighborhoods that can replicate a kind of community. You can, you can buy your way into that kind of civic health, but it's not civic anymore, it's a kind of, it's a, it's a kind of a, a consumer good. Consumer good. Yeah, it's a consumer good. Yeah. And the people who tend not to do that well in the system are precisely Lash's kind of, the working classes, where when Lash wrote, um, not the book you have next to you, The True and Only Heaven, when, when he wrote in 1995, The Revolt of the Elites, yeah. he has really eloquent and beautiful and inspiring passages in which he talks about the kind of, the virtues, the common virtues, the ordinary virtues of the working class, how they're much more communally oriented, how they develop certain kinds of virtues uh, that have to do with being closer to the ground, cl closer to the stuff of the world how they are much more likely to be conservative, not in an ideological sense, just in how they live their lives. They want to pass on a tradition to their children. So they, they kind of existed for a time, as Lash tells it, outside of the kind of the world that the elites were building at the time. This was 1995 that book was published. If you look today, and you look at the data today, these people that Lash said, this is the kind of the, the cradle of certain kinds of common, ordinary virtue, they're not doing well. And I think part of the reason they're not doing well, maybe a main reason they're not, they're not doing well, is because the, the, the kind of the values, the consequences of the elite and ruling class are being felt profoundly and tragically now among the working classes, the lower classes. It turns out that things like community, religion, associations, neighborhood, tr traditions, and so forth, this is a kind of public utility that you don't need to be wealthy to access. Right? I, I really think that we have to begin thinking of these as a kind of public utility that are available to everyone. This is what had to be demolished if we're going to be liberals. And the consequence has been now a kind of uprising from the populace, not because they're the paragons of virtue, but because they're desperate, because they're in some ways suffering under a system that is no longer serving them very well. That's right. Yeah. So I think, in a way, Lash, Lash analyzes something and doesn't in a way foresee and quite prophesy how bad it's going to get for the class that he thought might be the kind of the salvation of the American project. So, so your question is sort of where then do we turn? And we can again say that this is still maybe in our muscle memory, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's in our muscle memory, uh, but it's going to actually require the replacement of the current ruling class with a different ruling class or a change of their philosophy. And that's the proposal of my next well, book, When you talk Regime about the change. ruling class, you talk about the elite. Yeah, I'm talking about the people who are the our, entire our kinds of institutions who, yes. run, who, run the, who run the elite institutions in our society and set the tone and set the values and shape 
right, how our society is run. But the moment you say that, you know, paradoxically, then you, there's, a, there's an assumption or an implication that the only people who can do that are the, is, the, is the populist movement. Well, of course, um, the populist movement because can do it if, if um, through kind of raw electoral power. Now, yeah. if you're a Marxist, you might say they can have a revolution, they can overturn, right? It'll be pitchforks and they'll overturn the elites today. That's probably less likely uh, in our world today, although um, I think in a way what we're seeing around the world is a kind of electoral revolution, a kind of pushback, which is of course being, be, attempting to be suppressed by the elites. But what you're gonna need is what, you know, in part what Marx both argued for and um, demonstrated, which is a kind of a class, um, class traders. You're gonna need elites who are going to be on the side of those who they, you know, who, who they in a sense are siding against. You're gonna need basically people in the elite class who are going to say our elites now are so corrupt, are so bad, that we need to replace ourselves and we're gonna side with where the kind of electoral energy among the populace are. Now, this is, you know, this is of course almost verboten to even say this in probably our circles, right, to be Well, I mean, I mean, Christopher Lash talked about the, you know, the, 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 you know, talks about the history of the manufacture of consent, you know, beginning with Lippmann, Walter Lippmann, and so on, when he talked about, I mean, for the longest time, American democracy or American politics relied on the, on the manufacture of consent among the people. So basically people are being fed information. So if the media, for example, or if the, if it is in the hands of these elites, uh, how will people know what to do if they, if, if they cannot have, if they don't have control of the media of communication systems? Right. Well, of course, we're living in a time in which it's awfully difficult to control yes. the media, right? Yes. So Walter Lippmann, they say we have like three <laughs> newspapers and you know, a couple yes. radio stations. We're speaking on the day when it just has been released uh, that um, the U.S. government has reassessed its uh, view of the origin of the pandemic, and they believe it actually was from uh, mm -hmm. from Wuhan, yeah. from laboratories. Yes. Now, if you had said that a couple of years ago, you could potentially be fired. You would be, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you'd be denounced as you know, crazy. And a few days ago, uh, the, the you know the New York Times published an article by one of the columnists, the conservative, used to be with the Wall Street Journal, uh, Brett's Stephen yeah. Brett, yeah. Uh, that uh, the, 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 the gold standard of you know, research in, in, in the UK came up with the conclusion that the wearing masks, you know, any type of mask was completely right. so, useless. So in other words, um, you can manufacture consent yes. when people have a kind of respect and a willingness to sort of say, okay, if the media said it, Walter Cronkite said it, then it's true. That's gone. That is gone. Right? All over social media today for those who are already mistrusted the media what was CNN was saying, what, you know, what uh, the, the, the mainstream outlets were saying. They said, see, these people can't be trusted. It's all ideological, all the way down. They just want to control us. So there is, you could say that what we have now is we have no, you know, no ability to manufacture consent. What we do have is a kind of deeply divided world in which information is no longer trusted from one side or the other side, unless it's coming from their outlets. That's so we're, we're in a very, we're in a very different place than you know, something like Walter Lippmann is describing. And I'm not sure we can exactly predict where it's going to go, but I do think the idea that you can simply manufacture consent for the lower classes or for the consuming classes, that's probably not what, where we're going. Interesting, going because of the dis now the information is dispersed and it, it, because it's siloed. It, I yeah. mean, we have cable news and we have like social media, social media is, uh, and then everything else, yes. Yeah. So, so people really are, they're, you know, they're curating their own news line and their, their own news sources. And so it does become, like anything, it becomes a dangerous kind of echo chamber in which all kinds of conspiracy theories and, and you know, suspicion is really a widespread. But that's, that's the reality of where we are now. And I do have to say, coming out of COVID and coming out of a lot of the responses to COVID, it's not, uh, it's, not un, it, it, it's completely understandable uh, and even justified the suspicion now with which many are regarding the mainstream it, it, news sources. I, I think you're more optimistic than I am because I, during the pandemic, I read quite a few books uh, by, by mavericks or people who are considered to be extremists and not uh, in the conventional camp or traditional camp. One of them is Robert Kennedy Jr.'s book, uh, you know, The Case of Anthony against Anthony Fauci, which is a massive book. It was on the bestseller list of Amazon for months, number one on, on all categories. It was never reviewed in any of the mainstream newspapers. Uh, and because, because they have, they, 
they immediately have this bias against the author by you know he was anti-vax or whatever, whatever. I mean, instead of reading the book and trying to understand the case he's making, there was an absolute rejection and refusal to touch it. I mean, even though it was in, on Amazon and other sites, he's been number. I mean, I've never seen anything like that. It was number one from for months. So in what way am I being too optimistic or? Because the media would never allow us, uh, would never create that space. I mean, people are, will still be laboring and in the, in the margins or in the, in the shadows. I mean, that kind of possibility of having that kind of visibility to make your point. Right. So I, I don't surprised. think we're disagreeing. I, I, I okay. think what I'm saying is that people are finding their own alternative sources. And it might be Robert Kennedy's book. It might be a blog. It might be. You know, but nobody, if the media, if the mainstream media doesn't... They, they aren't watching that. They yes. aren't watching it. They aren't watching it anymore. And if they watch it, they're, they're mocking it. Yes. So they're getting completely different news sources. So we don't have a, you know, it's, we're, we're, we're no longer in the day where some network, some anchor can just tell us what, how we should see the world. And if anything, we're coming out of a period in which the suspicion of those sources is so deep that I don't see them winning back the level of respect that they may once have had during our lifetimes. But how can one beat, say, the New York Times? I mean, just like I read the New York Times, I subscribe to it, I'm sure you, a lot of people do. And now, I mean, I just read recently that they added, I don't know how many million of digital subscribers and so on. And so it's, people take it as, that's the word of God for, for yeah. a lot but of I think the, the establishment again, it's figures. Very select Yes. Self-selected audience. Yes. I used to read the New York Times. Yes. Because it was, I thought it was a great source of news. Yes. And I canceled my subscription several years ago, because I just I did I didn't believe that they were actually telling me objectively. You know, I think the news is still good. The news pages are good, but it's the, the way everything is slanted now. It has an ideological tenor to it that it didn't have 15, 20 years ago. I, I do think, and it'll be interesting to see what happens. I do think that there is a growing awareness among some of these outlets that they've gone too far, and a lot of it was reaction to Trump specifically, uh, and the fears and concerns and anxieties that Trump elicited. Those aren't completely gone, but they're realizing, I think to a degree, that they've gone too far. So you begin to see them trying to pull some of that back in. You see a little bit more balanced reporting, at least some, I'm not saying it's balanced, but a little bit, you get, you know, the, you know, the, 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 the reports today on the, on the virus, um, the uh, New York Times has hired a number of new, more conservative voices on, for their editorial pages. Yeah. So, so they, I think they're aware that they become, they've damaged their own brand in a sense as, as kind of purveyors of some kind of at least marginally respectable news source. That's why I'm saying, I mean, I'm not as optimistic as you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this isn't meant as in any way opti the, the last thing I'm used to is somebody <laughs> accusing me of optimism. I say this because um, I'm actually really concerned, and this, is, this moves us maybe yeah. to a little bit of a different topic, but I'm really concerned about what is likely to be the reaction to the, you know, the, the today's elites and their effort to, to foist a certain kind of a story and how it's further, further, you know, if, if you want to say there was this kind of populist element that was radicalized, and that was certainly there. I, I think it was always overblown and exaggerated. I actually think it's becoming more radicalized now um, than it was during the Trump years. I think it's becoming more radicalized because the sense that there's no control over any of these outlets, that all of the institutions now have clamped down on any kind of alternative way of seeing the world, you're seeing, um, I'm seeing, the rise of a increasingly uh, more Nietzschean way of seeing the world. In other words, conservatism for a long time was really driven by this kind of classical liberal tradition. Mm -hmm. right? It saw itself sort of in the Reagan mold. And you had you know, this kind of appeal to the American tradition, to the Declaration of Independence, to the Constitution, and that's what, what, what being conservative now. And there's a younger generation of conservatives who have, want to have no more to do with that. And what they really think is that what's really needed are strong people, manly, masculine people, who will simply take the reins of power and rule using force, using sheer power. That's, that's, the, con that's the consequence of what they see as the radicalization of the left. Now, when the left sees that, they become more radical. When the right sees the more radical left, they become more radical. 
And I'm afraid we're in a kind of spiraling cycle that's not, maybe the comparison to Weimar is too extreme, but it's not untoward in the sense that you have the ends, the kind of extremes, driving themselves more and more to further extreme positions. And, and, and being justified in doing so, in a sense, because they see the other side becoming more extreme. Yes. And I also, talking about the media, the, the media landscape, I can see the panic towards the incredible, fascinating panic that people have vis-a-vis -vis towards uh, uh, Tucker Carlson in his show on Fox. I mean, remember the New York Times ran three pages, four pages on him, like a, a study of him and his influence and so on and so forth. So there are these voices out there that speak to this other side, of the, which I pay attention to as well. And, and they don't seem to be unreasonable. They seem to be, they have a different logic, different way of seeing the world and so on. But those are considered, they're condemned by, again, by this mainstream media, mainstream establishments as extremist, as, uh, uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's a challenge. And then, of course, Fox itself is a corporation. And, it's a, and so it's a, you can only be part of a corporation to have a different voice, if you, if you will. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, someone like Tucker is really interesting because, again, you have, this, yes. you have this preconceived notion of what he is and what he says. I don't know, again, I don't know if anybody in the mainstream world paid attention to this. He had this conversation with uh, Ben Shapiro the other day, and the conversation turned to should um, automated trucking, automated drivers yes. be like, um, you know, the next thing that's introduced. And Tucker took a firm line against this. He said, no, it's a terrible idea. It would be a terrible idea for us to put like a quarter of the male workforce out of work. You know, and you basically put it in terms of it would be radically destabilizing to our country, yes. right? Without some kind of, you know, thinking about what needs to be, um, you know, done to in some ways help whether, whether it's some kind of transition to other kinds of work and so forth, whether it's rebuilding our manufacturing base or other kinds of work, gainful employment for high school educated, you know, young men or, or older men. Uh, in other words, Tucker was making arguments that might once have been recognized as left arguments. The problem is people, even these uh, liberals, Marxists even, they're not paying attention to him. Like I do pay attention to him, and what he sounds like, he sounds like um, he's not a re traditional Republican, he's not a Democrat, he's not, he, is, he represents another trend of movement, another philosophy, another well, you, ideology, you, if you will. You asked me earlier, yes. what are some traditions within the American tradition? Yes. And one of those would be you know, what Christopher Lash talks about in that yes. book, True and yeah. Only Habits, the populist yes. tradition. Now, when Lash talks about the populist tradition, he means it both in the kind of right populist as well as left populist. And in the American tradition, maybe the dominant way we think about populism is a kind of left populism, kind of economic populism against the kind of the financial interests, the railroad interests, the, the, um, the monopolies, uh, the ways in which you know, uh, farmers and small businessmen were being man manipulated by people in DC and so forth. William Jennings Bryan, the concern about the role and nature of money and the banking system. So you have this populist tradition and it's always had, in the American tradition, it's always had elements of both right and left combined in them. So William Jennings Bryan isn't just a left populist, he's also a fiery evangelical, yeah. right, who you know, condemns uh, you know, Darwinism, uh, not only as a, as a kind of uh, scientific concept, but how it's being used also as a political concept, social Darwinism. And people forget this about William Jennings Bryan, that he's, a, he's, he's, a, he's especially a critic of Darwinism because at that time, it's seen as a way of justifying why some people win, why some people are better, and why some people aren't. He's kind of deeply egalitarian. This is, again, this, 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 this language and tradition that's still uh, active and alive in our tradition, it's been very successfully suppressed. It has these moments where it emerges, yes. and then it gets suppressed by the kind of combined power of capital, sort of elite institutions, and so forth. Um, and I think we may be in one of those moments again. And uh, you know, I, it, you would have to say right now, from where I'm standing, there's a very fiery, uh, concerted effort to suppress it once again, to keep it within wraps. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, that may be successful, but it just seems to me the more you kick this can down the road going back to my earlier comments about radicalization, it's not gonna make things better. It's actually like, you know, like, like covering up a disease uh, with, with medicine, like, you know, it's not getting to the source. Yes. Wow, well, this is interesting. So your book is coming out this year, right? Regime yes. change? June, June 6th. June 6th. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I cannot wait. 
going to be another. So I have to bring you back okay. uh, to, uh, to talk to. about regime yeah. change. Okay. And, you know, um, uh, I think, you know, probably if we're talking about hope, for me, what hope is, is the, the impact of your book, uh, the, uh, Why Liberalism Failed. You know, apparently it's, it's doing very well. It's translated in many languages and uh, people are responding to it. Uh, I think they're looking for those kind. They at least they get the argument you're making. I think, and my that's my yeah. my suspicion. I guess you know, having lived with it now for five yes. years, um, what I would say as a general case is that most people, our generation yes. and older, read the book and they like part of it and they hate part of it. Mm -hmm. In other words, they tend to side on one side of the liberal spectrum or the other. They're either what we call conservatives or classical liberals or they're progressive liberals. And it turns out that because the book is a critique of liberalism as a whole, there are parts of the book that progressives can read, like President, former President Obama can read, and say, I like this part of the book, right? The critique of individualism, the critique of market capitalism, the critique of you know, the way in which you know, we, we cease to have obligations to each other. Progressives can read that. Conservatives can read it and they can see the critique of the kind of social progressivism, which is also a part of the book, right? The, the attack on family, the attack on, on religion, the attack on, um, you know, kind of culture and so forth. So half of the kind of people our age who grew up thinking that they were on the side of one part of liberalism or the other part of liberalism find half of it they like. And so I often will get people who said, I liked your book, but, and then they'll tell me which part, they, and then I can figure out where they were. Younger people people who are like our students, they read it and in many cases, they're sympathetic with the whole thing. So they have not grown up in the shadow of the Cold War. They are much less um, uh, enamored of the system as a whole and they are much more willing to entertain some kind of thinking about some kind of alternative. Yeah, and there's also the defense, the wrong, the, the, you know, the wrong uh, defense of self-interest, you know, but uh, when you talk about the liberal arts, it's the only kind of education that matters. There are a lot of people at the, at the university would, would, would uh, object to that. They say, no, these are the, the other disciplines we have are good and they're practicing and so on. So there'll be a, um, an attempt to um, uh, question those, those, those are elitist arguments like those because they're perceived to be elitist. See, I don't see them elitist yeah, at all. I know, in fact, I know. I, as I was saying earlier, I... Yeah. I, I invoked John Adams, who said, <laughs> we need to have education in liberal arts, especially for people who are kind of common, ordinary walks of life. Yes. It's not an elitist yes. approach. In fact, you know, it seems to me that those of us who are defenders, this is the global center, and uh, yes. the center of global humanities. Uh, I am a deep, ardent, committed uh, to humanities. I was an English major as an undergraduate uh, and um, to the liberal arts more broadly. If we think that one of America's great problems right now is a decline of our kind of civic life mm -hmm. and a kind of crisis of citizenship, why don't we actually reflect on the fact that every civilization that's called itself a republic or a democracy has seen liberal education as a central and core part of what it needs to be doing? Because it's not just getting a technical ability to do something. That's the servile arts. Right? That was a kind of lower form of education. The, the real way to have a good polity, especially if you're going to have a, you know, broad participation by citizens, is to have a well-educated, liberally educated citizenry, which doesn't mean it has to be a college education. In fact, it shouldn't be a college education or solely part of a college education. It should be embedded in the, uh, you know, in the earliest parts of a, of a person's education. So, I, so I, I think that if we think that we're in kind of political crisis, then we have to really think about the origins of that being an also an educational crisis. Uh, with those words, <laughs> we're gonna end. I mean, I'm so grateful to you for this conversation and for joining us at the Center for Global Humanities, which is an attempt to keep that tradition alive and despite all the constraints and the challenges facing us, both in the university and at a larger social level. And, um, we had just, I'm tremendously happy that you're here, and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's been delightful. Thank you. Thank you.